Why is there all this misunderstanding between Islam and the West? Well, there's reasons for it. Join me in the first of this special two-part 9-11 edition. This is Den on Religion. Hey peeps, it's Dr. B with Ten on Religion. This video is closed captioned here on YouTube and the transcript is available at tenonreligion.com. This is a special two-part edition of Ten on Religion on the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Not many religion YouTubers attempt a video on the perspectives between Islam and the West, but I thought this was a good opportunity to wade into the deep end of the pool here and try to explain what's going on. By the way, if you like religious studies content, go ahead and smash that sub button and share because it really helps out the channel. Okay, one huge thing to keep in mind here is that both the term and the idea of Islam mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, and that's one of the reasons why there's a lot of misunderstanding. And that was a lot of lots. So here's how this is going to work. The first episode is going to focus more on the West's side of the equation using the ideas of the Islamic scholar and author Tariq Osman. The second episode is going to focus on detailing some Islamic perspectives using the ideas of the Islamic scholar and author John Esposito from Georgetown University. Let's dive right in! This first episode is based on Tariq Osman's 2017 book, Islamism, What It Means for the Middle East and the World. Let's get into some background. In their tense confrontation with Western powers in the 1960s and 70s, many Arab nationalist regimes tried to discredit their liberal opposition as tools of the West, agents acting from within to disrupt the Arab people's cohesiveness behind their leaders. This demonization was not particularly difficult because for many Arabs, the notion of liberalism carried mixed connotations. Ideas such as the necessity of having multi-party democracies, respecting pluralism, <laughs> ensuring freedom of expression, and opening up to the world, especially the West, aroused suspicion. Globally, throughout the period from the 1950s to the 1970s, the Arab world's central struggles were against Western imperialism and in the Arab-Israel wars. Ensuring pluralism, protecting and respecting political and human rights, and many other democratic features came to be seen by large sections of Arab society as Western demands, instructions issued by the condescending West, or seemingly harmless terms that hid malicious schemes by the West to destabilize the Arab world. The Arab regimes, uh, many of which had anchored their legitimacy in the fight against colonialism, differentiated between cultural liberalism, which they favored, and political liberalism, which they demonized. The distinction went further. While the regimes became the guardians of cultural liberalism, the opponents, in many cases the liberals, became the agents working with the enemies to weaken us. Osman then describes what he sees as two dominant positions on how the West views Islam in the Middle East. In the first view, Islam goes beyond being a faith system because at its core, it is a social and political framework. Separating Islam from Islamism is an absolute must for the Islamic world. At some point in the future, the Islamic world will leave Islamism behind, retaining only Islam as a religion. Islamists who use Islam and name only just for political purposes will not ultimately succeed because their societies will move beyond the need to combine a religious frame of reference with domestic politics. Their societies will come to see that Islamization is not the answer to their social and economic questions. They will recognize that this Islamism inhibits social progress and so will ultimately throw the Islamists out of power. According to Osman, this first perspective encourages engagement with the Islamic world and the Islamists. In the second view that Osman describes on how the West views Middle Eastern Islam, any separation of Islamism from Islam negates the nature of Islam. Thus, it would ultimately be rejected by the majority of Muslims. Since they will never be like us, the West ought to see the Islamic world through our historical experience with it. Islam here becomes the other, which for centuries was the enemy. Political Islamists could develop their thinking and operations to win elections and ascend to power. They could change their rhetoric to deceive the elite of their societies who have become like us. 
Their Islamism has not evolved because it is incapable of evolving. Islamism here is not a stage in a long socio-political journey. It is an obstacle to the development of these societies. But because it is intertwined with Islam itself, the barrier is so entrenched that it is extremely difficult to remove. The conclusion is that Western-style liberal democracy is doomed to fail in the Arab and Islamic worlds for the foreseeable future. According to Osman, this second perspective distances the West from the Islamic world and is content to see Islamism marginalized or persecuted. It sees it not just as a symptom of the Islamic world's lagging behind, but as the essence of the danger that that world poses to the West. These are the two views that Osman describes regarding the Western perspective. He then argues that both of these views are condescending. They have failed in the key moments when the West has had to engage with the implications of Islamism, and they will continue to create Arab and Islamic enemies for the West. Crucially, both are Western-centric. Despite their different interpretations and policy implications, they look at Islamism through the prism of the West's own historical experience. They analyze it from within the West's current value system, and they devise policies towards it to lead to results that the West deems agreeable. But Western-centric perspectives fail to see the bigger picture, that Islamism cannot be understood solely through an assessment of the nature of Islam, nor can it be understood through a comparative analysis of the historical paths of Middle Eastern and European societies, and lastly, it cannot be understood by focusing only on the ways of thinking and means of operating of the Islamists themselves. So, Osman says, the choice will be either to look back to the tenets of the rational religion and try to emerge them with modernity, along with openness to change and highly flexible understandings of what an Islamic frame of reference means, or to look back in anger, reject modernity, see secularism as a threat destroying Islamic heritage and insist on a combative Islamism that repudiates the other. This latter path of modernity rejection will confirm and strengthen the struggle mindset. Here, many Islamists will embrace and espouse jihad in its broader self-definition, self-exertion for a higher cause. Some will hold the idea that Islamism is fighting the enemies of Islam, be they infidel Westerners, corrupt elites, or even secular Muslims. The wild card is the Arab secularists who are within the economically powerful upper middle classes in the large and culturally influential Arab countries. Uh, the question here will be whether these Arab secularists accept the Islamists, demand their inclusion in their country's political systems, and realize that exclusion and demonization make the social polarization worse. Wow, there's a lot of stuff to think about there in Osman's ideas. Uh, leave a comment uh, or two and let me know what you think. What did you think about Tariq Osman's ideas on the two perspectives he described about the West's view of Islam in the Middle East? It just seems like there's a lot of misunderstanding on both sides, but with so many perspectives on both sides, it's challenging to try to reconcile this. Check out the next episode where we're going to shift to some Islamic perspectives using the ideas of the Islamic scholar and author John Esposito, specifically his 2005 book, Islam, the Straight Path. Esposito differentiates between Islamic revivalists and radical activists, and also describes four orientations towards change in Islam. I hope I was able to help you understand some of the big pictures surrounding Islam and the West. Until next time, stay curious. If you enjoyed this, please like and share this video and subscribe to the channel. This is Den on Religion.